Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrzej Antiga and we are welcoming you from Berlin and uh, many other places. Today we'll present a new perspective on trying to decarbonize the very challenging sector, the passenger transport sector. And uh, I will start presenting, but we will also have presentations by our excellent guests. Um, we will start with Perspective from Lithuania by Kristina Gocha from the House Centras. Uh, we will also have an in introduction on some best practices from Raul Kazan from the CLSS in Romania. And last but not least, we will take you to Poland about Piotr Szanowski from Wiza Europe. Um, I would start by saying a few words about the tool that we developed in the framework of a project financed by the uh, by OIT, by the European Climate Initiative. Um, and uh, the tool offers um, to present a much more, to, to develop a much more co comprehensive uh, perspective on strategies on how to governize the transport sector, at the same time promote and increase in mobility levels. Um, the rationale between the uh, transport, the TEDIT tool, uh, was developed when we looked at the main challenges that the policymakers are facing when designing policy framework for passenger transport. First of all, there is some lack of policy relevant data. There is quite a lot of data, no doubt about it, but uh, the data is sometimes challenging to operationalize. So the policymakers do not really, are not quite sure what to do with this data, how to react in terms of policies. The data may also be spread across different places and cover different sectors, subsectors. Um, so what we did try to do in this tool as well is to harmonize the data sources and to come up with a con uh, with a comprehensive um, information for each lever that I will mention in a second. And some data is not available at all, and that's especially challenging for walking and cycling, two modes of transport that we have to promote if we want to decarbonize our transport sector. Another challenge that policymakers are facing is time pressure. So they usually working under uh, very intensive work uh, pressure and therefore they do not have enough time to look at different studies, different best practices. So this is uh, why in our project beyond best practices, we would like to make very concrete suggestions on how certain drivers of emissions from the transport sector can be addressed. They also do not really know how to close certain policy gaps. So best practices are there, but how to use them in the policy framework, in the uh, policy architecture that is driving emissions uh, reduction. And finally, because of this time pressure, um, the suggestions and policy that are introduced and developed address the same levers. This is especially the case when we look at emissions intensity of passenger cars. It does need to be addressed, no doubt about it, but we are ignoring many other levers that can also uh, play an important role in reducing emissions from the passenger transport sector. For example, activity levels or load factors. And there's also misalignment between effort and outcome. For example, we do pay a lot of attention to emissions intensity of passenger transport, passenger vehicles, but we do not, really, do not pay too much attention to the activity le levels and load factors as well. So as a result, we decided to disaggregate the main drivers of emissions. We looked at the nine modes of transport. Uh, so here you can see them to the right, that's passenger trans passenger cars, obviously, buses, motorcycles. We also covering um, aviation, domestic, international, walking, cycling, trams, and uh, subway. For almost all of those modes of transport, we also identified three levers. So for those emitting ones, uh, we look at the activity levels in passenger kilometers per year annually. We look at emissions per vehicle, and we look at how many people are in this vehicle, because the eureka moment that was the driving um, element argument for this project and for this approach was a realization that if in Poland, the load factor of passenger cars were kept at the same level in 2019 as in 2000, emissions from transport sector would have increased half as fast. And no one really worried about the fact that we will have cleaner cars, but traveling much more often and being much bigger and, and emptier at the same time. So um, this was the, one of the main driving forces behind the project. We provided the values for the levers for 2000 to 2019, and the users can select values for 2030 and 2050 to develop their own scenarios and their own 
um, assessment of what is providing the biggest impact in terms of policy action. Changing the values of the different levers will immediately show the impact on emissions levels and uh, mobility. We will show it that in a second. And we developed a tool for Hungary, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, and the EU. However, it can be adapted for many other countries and many other levels as well. And almost every lever is accompanied with a list of policy measures that can shift the values of the levers in the desired direction so that there's the connection between data and between policy measures that can be introduced. Now, let me take you to the tool itself um, that uh, you can see and you can find under this link. And uh, this is the front page. And again, we are also um, welcoming any suggestions and um, ideas how can we further make this tool useful for policymakers and stakeholders? Let me take you, for example, to Poland. And uh, these are some of the values that we developed. So this is the starting point. We received values to 2019. The reason why we decided to go for 2019 is because it's before the pandemic. So 2020 is already a different year for, and, and, and one that is extraordinary for many different reasons. And the availability for data of data for 2021 is not there yet. So this may change in the future. For now, our base year is 2019. So what we do is to harm, we just harmonize this all to 2019 levels. And uh, we decide we, for example, can figure out and develop a scenario in which poles travel slightly more, slightly less by car in 2030 and much less in 2040 and 2050. The cars may be slightly fuller in 2030, and at the same time, they may, res they may stay rather empty in 2050 because of, for example, autonomous cars. Um, emissions, let's assume they will decrease um, quite radically and uh, will have mostly carbon neutral cars by 2050. These are the cars on the road, not the cars that are currently sold. So this is slightly different than the emission standards. We can do this for all the 21 levers that we identified, actually. Um, I will just suggest also going to railway, where we do have some, let's say, increase, modest increase in 2030, and then let's assume rapid development of faster trains, and 2050 we will have much higher activity levels for this mode of transport. Um, and at the same time, maybe aviation would be much less uh, popular, obviously, domestic aviation would be closely to non-existing uh, in 2030, 2050. And uh, we assume we may assume that international elevation would reduce slightly in 2030 and much more in 2050 because of some alternative modes of transport. These are just ideas that you may come up with. But you can see immediately here the impact of this scenario, very um, uh, preliminary scenario. Uh, on mobility and on emissions. So by 2030, emissions would be decreased by 53%, 2050 by 82%. But keep in mind, we didn't really play with all the levers. That's something that can be easily done. And uh, mobility would decrease much less. We have to differentiate between mobility that is welcomed and uh, for leisure, for example, and mobility that is maybe less welcome, like commuting to work. So this is um, the way the tool looks like. I will come back to this uh, website in a second, but just continuing with the explanation what TEDIT can do actually. First of all, it can help to identify gaps and overlaps in policies addressing emissions from passenger transport. So this is something that policymakers when developing a scenario can ask themselves. Is there a policy that could drive emissions reduction by addressing respective lever? Did I only cover those policies that's been introduced in other policies or something that we've dealt before? But what about load factor, for example? What about the um, activity levels? Can we do something about those um, drivers of emissions? Um, so this is something that policymaker can think about using our tool to make the policy framework much more comprehensive. Another point, another question that they can ask themselves is, has too much attention been given to certain lever at the cost of another one? And that's a question that uh, may result in shifting of resources that are limited, for example, from promoting electric vehicles 
uh, towards, for example, development of um, other cleaner modes of transport like railway or uh, walking and cycling. What TEDIT can also do, and that's something that you've just seen live, is support develop in developing drafts of emission reduction scenarios. We do not expect TEDIT to be the final destination for developing national transport strategies, but we expect this um, to be the starting point for such strategies, something that the stakeholders could think about that they wouldn't have thought without this tool. Here you have something that I've just done um, on the tool. For example, if you shift, if you reduce um, activity levels for passenger cars, if you have the emissions of the uh, vehicles on the road for cars, for buses, uh, if you increase the, lo uh, the load factor and you return it to 2000 levels and you move 500 kilometers from aviation to rail, the emissions would decrease by 59% and mobility by only 11%. So this is something that is showing you uh, the impact of different measures. And finally, what we also do, what the tool does is provide initial ideas on how to shift the values in the desired direction. This takes me again to the tool almost each lever is accompanied with a link to um, the list of some best practices. So what you have here are exactly the levers and uh, what we uh, can have uh, here to the, to the right, uh, for example, is uh, the best practices that can drive emissions and drive the levers in the expected direction. So how do I increase activity for railways, hoping that this will reduce emissions and activity levels for the highly intensive modes of transport like aviation or cars. These are some of the options. Night trains, for example, excellent way to reduce emissions from uh, trains um, from transport sector. That's something that's been discussed already. Uh, reduce tickets, taxes. Um, keep in mind, this is also a short description of the policies, something that we develop using already existing resources. This is answering the question, the challenge that policymakers are facing of not having enough time to look into all the studies that were published, but we are happy to, ref to refer to existing studies here and provide links. Uh, but so this is just starting base for the policymakers to serve the time to increase um, efficiency of, this, of the policy strategies and also to use already existing studies that again, uh, we can happily add to this website. So these are initial ideas. Um, what that it cannot do, just to be frank about it as well, is we do not really quantify the impact of these policy measures on emissions. We don't do it because it would be too challenging and it would be way beyond the scope of the project. For example, taxation of international aviation, increasing taxation, would have different impact on the activity levels for aviation in Poland, in Romania, would result in model shift between different modes of transport depending on the development of railway, for example, then this would result uh, in shift from aviation, from air to, to rail. In other cases, it may increase road transport. So the quantification is not there. The best practices or the practices, not always best, show you how do we get in this direction, but uh, does not do not show you how far you will go for this more in-depth studies would be needed. And this is topic for another project, in fact. We also didn't compare the selection with another, another future scenarios. Um, this, is, this was driven by the desire to keep this tool simple and understandable. And again, it's the beginning of a designing a strategy uh, for a given country and uh, to look into certain options that could have been this, this, um, looked into in the policy framework. And last but not least, we also, uh, the tool is all, only prepared for national level. We could, the, the tool can be adapted to the city level, depending on the city, depending on the amount of data. And um, at the certain data is easier available at the city level, for example, for cycling and walking, and other data is only available at national level. But what we would be glad to do is to share information or share their Excel file and the whole idea, how does it work with interested stakeholders, just let us know. We can also happily talk to you and provide explanation how this tool can be adapted to the specific city or to the circumstances of other countries. Now, the remaining four presentations um, will go into specifically how do we deal with 
uh, the best practices. Just last point I would like to address is the issue of the model shift. So we are addressing the issue of model shift indirectly in the tool. This is why we include and promote increasing activity for railway. Increasing activity for railway will increase emissions slightly because not all railway is zero carbon. However, this is um, something that will hopefully drive emissions uh, or, dry, or decrease activity levels for highly emitting modes of transport like aviation or road transport. Obviously, even if walking and cycling do not emit anything, we do hope that moving to this mode of transport will decrease activity levels for emitting modes of transport. So this is how we cover model shift. And uh, the policymakers, stakeholders on the ground will be able to better as, uh, assess what impact this increase in activity for low carbon means of transport will have on highly intensive modes of transport like um, flying or, or, or driving. Now we will have three presentations um, dealing with specific best practices, uh, broader framework uh, from Lithuania. So Christina, over to you. Thank you, Angie, and hello, everyone. I'm, I'm happy and proud to be here and to present a little bit of practice from Lithuania, which is not very local based and it's a rather holistic approach than localized best practices, but I hope it fits to, to our uh, content and format today. So if, if you could go to the next slide, Angie, I, I would like a little bit with just a few words to, to describe, um, uh, let's say, problematic and a question which we are trying to address with new spatial approach in Lithuania. So I, I don't know how, how much it's relevant to, to another countries in our neighborhood and in whole Europe, but in Lithuania, public transport, which basically needs to, to carry persons to, to commute daily, uh, it is very, very much, uh, how to say, limited by boundaries, administration boundaries of uh, cities and regions and uh, districts uh, public transport it's traveling to uh, that that leads us to not having unified ticket to not have it combined timetables to not having uh, uh, enough multimodal multimodality options and of course altogether that leads to to how Angie said already to very unfriendly and very unsustainable model shift between uh, trips uh, among passengers. So in Lithuania, we designed uh, until 2050, Angie, next slide, please, uh, a spatial concept, which already is addressing uh, transportation needs, not by, not by administrative borders of districts or regions, but uh, really connecting and addressing functional needs of people to commute to work, to study, for cultural, for business, and, and other trips uh, on daily basis. That uh, basically means that, um, <laughs> and, and it's really difficult to solve, with, uh, especially with uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Financial Ministry, but uh, this question basically needs that different regions with different parts of the regions need to uh, agree and uh, to develop a common transportation system, which would cover public transport, all the, all the modes, uh, railway and buses and coaches, as well as multimodality points to change or even to provide mobility as a right option for very, very not densely urbanized areas. So there are more questions and uh, challenges than solutions, but we are working already on this topic and we are trying some pilot projects, uh, city plus region or city plus another city to see how it's possible to, to connect all the system into the, into the whole public transport and uh, um, multimodality hub, but not to have separate things. Uh, of course, uh, possibilities uh, in the whole country, they are not equal. And uh, as elsewhere, we have uh, very dense urbanized areas with a lot of uh, need for commuting and we have less urbanized area for, for less uh, commuting. And of course, for economical reasons, less economical reasons to provide very frequent public transport, for example, in those areas. So what we are suggesting and what we are trying to implement, and we already tried it in Wilma's case, I, I, will, I, I will speak a few minutes minutes later about it, uh, we think that a uh, whole area cannot be served equally with uh, the same quantity and quality of, for example, public transport, but it can have some hierarchy where you collect 
people from very low urbanized areas and, and with small, with short radar, you bring them to moderate efficiency zone and then people can change to uh, already uh, frequent and convenient public transport and go to very high efficiency zone where public transport works much, much better than private car. So that is the concept. And next slide, please. And as I said, we tried already to to put in a place in Vilnius with uh, the idea of sustainable urban mobility plan and local master plan. Uh, we are already trying to implement this hierarchy public transport system in the city. We have some fast routes. Uh, we have main routes of buses and trolley buses, and we are suggesting to have a uh, shuttle service uh, from collecting people from suburbs and, and bringing them to those main and fast routes. And uh, the idea is to have short reader, but to have frequent and uh, convenient and reliable public transportation so people can uh, can connect easily to the places we need. Uh, but also the, uh, another important thing that in city already you can easily to implement idea of multimodality and we have some pilot projects like multimodality points where you can come with your bicycle, for example, your first or last mile, you can come with your bicycle or scooter to store it safely uh, in the storage room and then go with fast public transport bus, for example. And uh, we also are connecting all the systems into the same places, shared bicycle, shared scooters, shared, shared cars, uh, uh, park and ride system, and every, 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 every measure uh, are trying to be connected uh, to people and to the city infrastructure. So it addresses all the issues. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this idea of a wellness came, uh, as I already mentioned, it, it basically was uh, uh, addressed and picturized in our sustainable urban mobility plan for wellness, but wellness is not the only the only city which has it. And uh, I, I would like to, I, I know that it happened in Romania and Poland and Hungary and all the European countries as well, but uh, for such small countries as Lithuania, they have 20 uh, they have 20 sustainable urban mobility plans is quite a quite a challenge and nice challenge uh, which was already addressed. So what we have to for a first and I, I would like also to connect it to the this holistic approach and holistic uh, how to say holistic hub for best practices and cases. Uh, to address climate change and transportation needs. So what we had first is uh, it was guidelines for sustainable urban mobility plans. They were something in between uh, from European guidelines, which were adopted a little bit earlier and uh, something between uh, Lithuanian practice and the culture of planning. So those guidelines uh, were accepted uh, quite well and 20 cities and towns now we have uh, sustainable urban mobility plans. Next slide, please. For those, I, I do not believe that there is a single person in audience which doesn't know sustainable urban mobility plan concept, content, idea, and uh, uh, and outputs. But still, if there is at least one person, just briefly to mention, sustainable urban mobility plans also connects uh, as planning for people. and planning for daily and uh, episodic people needs to travel in the city and to do it as much as possible sustainably uh, with uh, less uh, impact to the climate change. So uh, these plans are answering different questions, cycling, public transport, walking, low emission zones, parking policy, and, uh, and uh, the rest like social infrastructure layout and a lot of many questions too. But main result, which sustainable urban mobility plans wants to achieve is of course, again, as Angie said uh, at, at his presentation, is to achieve changes in model split for the city or for entire country. Uh, so uh, in Vilnius, uh, we have a successful plan which was uh, being implemented and started to have some changes, but then as in the whole world, COVID came and uh, all the fingers, uh, public transport dropped and but walking raised and so on. But uh, my main thing to say about SCMPs and they, 
the impact and possible impact on climate change, that is, if people are owning those plants as it happened in Vilnius, I, I believe, then people are, are not allowing the politicians to make unfriendly, environmentally unfriendly decisions, which is, I think, very good. And, and even without or with data, it, it proves that it's effective measure to go. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so regarding uh, regarding evaluation and uh, data driven policy, uh, I do not I do not say I do not want to say any uh, how to say sad things about implementation of those plans. But uh, one thing uh, which I think needs to be mentioned it's monitoring. Uh, implementation happens, but as as I put slide with Vilnius, uh, you can see uh, in this in this middle of the the picture in the middle that normally i don't know why but i i, I know why but normally measures with low priority are in, in place and with high priority are in place and those measures which are in middle which are really difficult to implement which really needs a, a high political acceptance and support which are expensive or sometimes they are for free but we need some big changes Somehow, some why those measures are not implemented, and and in two years from uh, now, it's already three more than three years after the sustainable urban plan was in, uh, adopted, we monitored results of it, and now we can see how many measures in which topic we implemented, but still we do not have this uh, uh, this uh, evidence with effect on climate change, which possibly those measures did. So, and when we were planning, we didn't have this tool like TEDIT to test which measure could be mostly effective and could be should be prioritized and implemented first. So I, uh, yeah, so I believe for those who will be doing uh, SUMPs uh, in the next few future, and if they will be able to adapt TEDIT for city level, that will be great tool. It uh, doesn't matter which lever it, it covers. Next, and I think last slide, uh, almost slide, next slide, uh, almost last slide, just, just to mention also that implementation and uh, effect on climate change, it doesn't really uh, depends only on finances, but it, 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 it very depends much on the owner. As I said, in Vilnius case, community is owning plan itself, but it's not implementing. But what else we have, we have municipal enterprise, which covers all the topics which were mentioned in the wellness plan. It covers parking policy, it covers public transport, it covers shared, uh, shared vehicles, it covers uh, infrastructure for bicycles, uh, park and rides, uh, multimodality points, and so on. So when implementation is in one hand, in one couple of hands or one entity, it leads to success. And that, that is something I am happy about. And uh, last slide, Angie, please. And uh, uh, showing this um, connection, I don't know if, if I was <laughs> successful to show this connection, but my point was to show that from national policy, which is spatial and uh, rather rather spatial than strategic from national policy, having different mobility zones, localizing uh, uh, ideas in city level within SUMPs. It leads, it's like snowball. First of all, it's small, but then it leads to numerous of guidelines, policies, monitorings, discussions, political changes, and so on. And we are just about to approve uh, updates for uh, new guidelines for sustainable urban mobility plans and also guidelines for low emission zones, which I think is also an effect of, of uh, the work we are doing in projects like this. I know I took a few minutes more. Sorry, guys. <laughs> thank no you. worries. That is excellent and definitely worth it. Uh, thank you very much, Christina. Um, Raul, uh, now Raul will take us to Romania. Over to, over to you, Raul. Thank you. Um, first of all, I need to tell you that uh, Romania makes a special case all the time in all matters related to policies and politics altogether. Um, I can start with a short story right now. Um, um, Ten years ago, we had as two Celsius with some partners, we uh, had pushed into the parliament and actually passed a law on green public procurement. 
And it actually went through and today Romania has a central law on green public procurement for the mere reason that we pushed it with many NGOs from all over Romania. Um, most countries don't do that. I mean, it doesn't make any sense because this is a purely local initiative. So basically everybody from local administrations, local governments, whatever, are supposed to do that by themselves. I mean, this is what green public procurement is. You respect some standards and you apply them because it's commonsensical, kind of. Romania is not commonsensical. And uh, this is how we got to the part of low emission zones. And we noticed, we observed that in not a single Romanian city, with one exception, but this is much more recent, with the exception of Cluj, Cluj Napoca. Um, cities did not have low emission zones whatsoever. So um, then we were wondering, what the hell can we do about this thing? You know, since uh, we identified three ways, three big ways, three uh, paths by which we can go to that, they were kind of like you know places to test everything and. Uh, first one is to have a sump, right? I mean, you have low emission zones in the uh, sustainable urban mobility plan, but sustainable urban mobility plans didn't really have them. Then, like in the UK or even in Germany, you can um, uh, you can take the municipality to court, and via court decision, you can um, have some or you know make it some sort of an obligation for the for the municipality to create low emission zones in the city, which is possible and it's been very successful again in Germany and, and in the UK. Uh, again, via court, this is the second. And the third, make a law. So how can we make a law? I mean, did anyone do that? And actually we realized that there was a model at European level is the Dutch model. The Dutch actually made a law that is related to low emission zones. Uh, how did we get there is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is very interesting. And um, why we need that? Well, first of all is because most especially in the last couple of years, even the Romanian institutions that are usually very opaque opened up and suddenly we realized that the emissions of, um, um, of uh, dust, so PMs, right, uh, 2.5 and 10, and then uh, NOx and SOx and um, carbon monoxide and everything were, were extremely, extremely high. What you have in these pictures, in this picture, is uh, actually uh, official data from recently anyway, I don't exactly remember the day, but I just made a capture and I'm showing it to you. And I, I put the little, you know, smoke clouds over them. Now let's go to the second slide. Um, I'm gonna brag a little on everything that we tried as two Celsius, as an organization, in order to improve the whole thing related to low emission zones. And um, first of all, we created, um, uh, networks in Romania by which we can measure. So that was for the time when the state institutions, institution, the National Authority for Environmental Protection actually started to measure properly values. We had a Romanian version of Luftaten. I guess everybody knows Luftaten. Uh, it was shocking stuff that we got most especially in Bucharest and most especially in PM's values, which were you know, overpassing limits 10 times. Uh, and then we created even a more um, professional, so to say. So that means that we put a lot of money into sensors uh, in, a, in a network which is called IR Live. And this is very, very accurate. And it started to be very pre respected by the state institutions and actually uh, take it as, 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 as true values of air quality. Uh, at the same time, we studied a case against Bucharest by which we tried to uh, cancel the uh, sustainable urban um, mobility plan for the simple reason that it had absolutely no indicators related to uh, emissions, first of all, and second of all, no way of monitoring all that. 
it, it wasn't a strong case for us, but adding up the fact that we weren't consulted in any way or the civil society wasn't consulted in any way, we won. So basically what we managed to do last year was to cancel this in court. And right now Bucharest is without a sustainable urban mobility plan, but it's gonna come up in a couple of months and no, in one month actually, and we're being consulted constantly. <laughs> And uh, this is the good news, which takes us to the next slide, in which uh, I explain with a lot of words, and it's, this is the most boring slide that you could possibly see. I don't usually do that, but basically what, what we started to do is to find progressive uh, MPs in the Romanian parliament. And it's a lot of them. For our surprise, it was plenty of them. We, we weren't expecting to have so many. Uh, and they started over with uh, this sort of uh, legal uh, initiative to make a low emission zone law. And with this law, which will be mandatory on the whole territory of Romania, the local administrations, local governments will take it as a, as a legal framework and actually implement by law and mandatorily uh, low emission zones in their respective um, uh, territories. Now, at this point, the law is in the um, in the Committee of Environment in the Romanian Senate. It's going to pass. It's going to be read in the plenary very soon, again in June. And uh, most, I, I don't know exactly how the legal draft looks like right now, but like until a week ago, it identified the uh, concrete evidence of the local problem in in the first articles. I mentioned here major local pollutants. I and we mentioned the extent and spatial extent uh, the extent of the congestion problem in respective cities, the local demographics and the way the cars are flowing into the locality, and the public priorities um, around the air quality in general in that local uh, municipality. Now, uh, there are also rules and uh, stuff that is already being discussed about public participation and uh, access routes and exceptions that are supposed to be done, say to ambulances or supply chains or whatever. But the thing is that at this point, we're at the, at the stage in which we're going to most probably have a law that imposes low emission zones, stuff that it hasn't been done so far, only in the Netherlands, uh, I must say that because for me, it's like a, not a legal, but a legislative experiment really. And I hope it's gonna be successful, but coming back to the Dutch, well, they didn't do like Romanians. They didn't create a framework top down, but they did it bottom up. I mean, they had so many less all over the country that they needed to you know, establish some rules altogether and they centralized the rules eventually just to give them um, uh, some sort of a fluency. Well, Romania is going to be bottom up. Usually it goes like that for the simple reason that um, uh, social capital is pretty weak. There is uh, administrative capacity, which is at a very, very low point. And sometimes we have to surpass for environmental reasons, uh, local initiatives. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, the most important thing at this point is to like uh, prepare a calendar for all this and basically uh, this is a calendar which is like um, both for petrol and diesel which is like pretty much uh, shared by um, everybody say in Europe um, at this point uh, the region of Brussels is doing this very thing uh, that they're phasing out slowly slowly in the so to say acceptance of uh, different uh, sorts of engines and uh, cars with uh, certain amounts of um, emissions usually these emissions are related to euro but uh, there are also co2 emissions that are being considered in other localities which is something very interesting to consider so basically we are thinking of establishing uh, systems of monitoring control uh, review and enforcement which are like uh, going to be uh, implemented at local levels and carried out by uh, means of central government and power. So this is the first um, the first um, 
good practice that I, I wanted to, to present to you. Uh, it was too long probably, but um, the next one, I'm gonna make it shorter because again, the big, uh, <laughs> it's not a special case Romania here, but it's like a very simple case. I mean, the simplicity that entangles Romania in this matter is, uh, is um, painful for the reason that um, we have a Romanian paradox that I'm defining right here. Unfortunately, you cannot see the arrow, but it's like at this point, there are regional trains that uh, are functional and they work, they carry people, passenger trains, of course, uh, on electrified um, railways. However, they work on diesel. And to me, this is probably the most absurd situation. It's, it's not even, it's, it's not, I, you you wouldn't even spend you know time to to justify anything like that because in quantitative terms obviously the emissions are massive, but in qualitative terms it's simply ridiculous. So um, when it comes to the very simplicity of the problem in Romania, well that problem relies in the fact that uh, the big problem lies in infrastructure and rolling stock. So basically, most investments have to go into this. It's pretty simple. Why? Well, that is, 30 years ago, Romania was pretty well off when it came to electrified lines uh, in the whole uh, network system of Romania. But um, uh, ever since, so we, we're talking about four decades of, I would say, misconduct and something that is tangential to probably criminal activity from the part of the government that literally destroyed most part of the of the rail network of Romania ended up in um, in uh, in trains attending at speed of 55 kilometers an hour on average. Uh, well, the, the average, if if you add even the faster trains, goes to 68 kilometers an hour. Um, Night trains are pretty much almost inexistent with two probably mentionable ex uh, examples, one to Timisoara from Bucharest and the other one from Bucharest towards Baia Mare via Cluj, which is pretty good. But suddenly domestic flights are gathering pace, which is absolute madness for the simple reason that we're talking about distances of 600, 700 kilometers covered by an airplane, which are normally distances that are supposed to be covered by trains. Um, road transport, however, is the only option at this point. And um, uh, thank you, Andre. It's, uh, <laughs> you're speeding me up. I'm, I'm going to continue this bragging also in the fact that we are also partners in Europe on Rail. It's another OIKI sponsored project. Um, and it's, it's, it's where we uh, are coming up with good practices. Uh, pretty well drawn for the um, for the for the Romanian state that is supposed to get involved into this, and what are we are proposing is actually at the European level to get you know loans from the European Investment Bank if it's possible. We are proposing something I would say revolutionary or crazy, and that is to have a rolling stock pool at European level, if that is possible. It's it's still kind of kind of crazy to understand this, but at this point it might be possible for transborder trains, hopefully. And uh, we pushed and <coughs> many uh, local municipalities associations pushed to have uh, within the recovery and resilience plan of Romania to have over 5 billion euro invested into um, railways. It is mostly rolling stock and uh, having more or reviewed, uh, renewed, sorry, um, electrified rails. Um, also money could come from connecting Europe facility. In this point where you don't have uh, um, electrified rails, uh, we managed to see that uh, what it's called the authority for uh, railway reform, which is a very new, a very new uh, agency pretty much invented recently, but it's a good institutional response if you ask me, uh, is focusing on hydrogen trains and they're putting a lot of money into it as they do also in other parts 
in Europe, most especially in France, as far as I understood. And there we're going to have um, hydrogen trains starting 2025, 2026 as a, as a response to the lack of electrified lines here and there. Uh, the final slide, uh, dear Andre, doesn't make any sense anymore because basically I was supposed to show, and oh, I'm doing it, to show the lines that are being renewed there and uh, electrified further. So thank you. That's the two experiments that I proposed to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Raul, for that. And before I give over to Piotr, um, I would just like to um, just to connect um, this perspective with TEDIT itself, that so that you that the picture is clearer. What we're talking about, why we do it, why do we have different presentations? Just the main point is that all present all best practices that uh, Christina and uh, Raul mentioned and that Piotr will mention in a second can be linked to one of the levers. So for example, night trains or lack of those um, could address the issue of activity levels for railways if we have this night trains again. Um, the electrification of railway tracks, uh, you know, they are electrified, they're just not used. Uh, but if you use them electrify, electrified railway tracks, that's in emissions intensity of railway tracks. So this again, another lever that we have. Um, and uh, going into low emission zones, that's activity for passenger cars because that would discourage people from using passenger cars. Uh, going to SUMPs and more integrated planning. One of the main, um, levers that would be addressed here would be activity levels for walking and cycling because if you integrate especially using public transport with the other modes of transport that would increase activity for those low carbon alternatives it's just the main perspective here is again just that you can lift a link um, each of the levers to one of the best practices which applies also to um to Piotr's presentation Piotr, over to you Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to show you some information from uh, important for in the, from Polish uh, side. So uh, one of the most uh, important document in Poland in the uh, e-mobility uh, in, in development and infrastructure is uh, the Act on e-mobility, uh, which introduced the goals from uh, local governments in Poland. Uh, as you can see on the left side, uh, on the left uh, picture, uh, the implementation of the act uh, implements some goals from local governments uh, with more than 50,000 inhabitants. So we have a share of the zero emission buses in the fleet of the uh, city buses in the city. Uh, now we, ha we have to... Uh, implemented to more than 5% of the zero emission buses in our cities. After the new year, it will be 10%. Uh, and additionally, we have the next uh, very important document is a Polish energy policy, which uh, implemented uh, for the local government uh, with a population over 100,000 uh, uh, inhabitants additional obligation. So after 2025, uh, those city uh, can only buy a zero emission buses. And in 2030, public transport will be fully decarbonized in the cities. Uh, and what's important in the Poland that um, the biggest uh, fleet of uh, electric buses in our country ha has Warsaw. It's more than 160 buses. It's more, it, it's, um, only mm, only London and Moscow have uh, more uh, buses, electric buses in their fleets in Europe. Uh, and uh, if we have um, this a share of zero emission buses in Poland, there are some cities in uh, our country that have uh, that have uh, done a lot of work. Some kind of city like Jaworzno. Uh, which have uh, more than 60% of uh, fleet uh, with zero, zero emission uh, buses, or Zielona Góra, which have uh, almost half of uh, their fleet of buses, uh, which are zero emission and electric. Uh, for now, we have six, over 700 electric buses registered in Poland, only uh, three cities have more uh, electric buses on, on, their, on their country, so it's Great Britain, France, and Sweden. And unfortunately, we don't have lot, lots of uh, 
hydrogen buses. Uh, it's uh, connected with uh, no lack of the infrastructure in Poland. We have only one uh, hydrogen station and it's private in, and the owner is uh, one of the Polish uh, TV stations. So it's not uh, public, so it, it can be used in uh, uh, public transportation. Uh, and um, if we talk about the uh, fin financial uh, for funding the electric buses in Poland, we have uh, we have four large calls for funding for that kind of vehicles. Um, it uh, uh, it allowed for find to finance over eight. eight 150 buses and their total uh, budget was almost uh, 3 billion uh, Polish zlotys. Uh, as you can see on the table, uh, every kind of uh, financial scheme have uh, lots of uh, funding for electric buses. And unfortunately, many of the funding requests had to be rejected uh, due to a lack of budget. So it shows how popular uh, those kind of uh, transportation uh, system like electric buses are popular in Poland. Can we change the slide? Okay. So what we have to do to... Uh, mm, change the implementation and reduce the environmental impact on the transport is first of all is a change in the generation of the electricity mix so we know that polish have the one of the most uh, fossil fuel at the uh, 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 market uh, and it's really uh, important for in the context of the war in the ukraine so we know that we must to uh, we have to uh, reduce the import of the fossil fuels from Russia. Uh, what the, what's the next uh, important thing is uh, create the sufficient infrastructure for uh, uh, e-mobility and hydrogen. So uh, we need to create a hydrogen uh, station for buses and uh, develop an infrastructure, infrastructure for uh, electric buses. Uh, what's uh, really important that's a uh, continuation of the government projects like uh, green public transport as I showed in the previous slide so create create the new funding schemes for uh, smaller communities for finance finance the purchase of the uh, electric buses and I think that one of the important thing is uh, increase the domestic potential of the Poland. So Poland is the larger exporter of electric buses in the uh, EU and the largest producer of the batteries for electric vehicles. So this is a big potential for whole Europe and for Poland to become a leader in that uh, kind of, in that type of uh, transportation. And uh, second uh, practice I would like to show you is a, uh, mm, bike sharing uh, which uh, have three uh, 13 years uh, history in Poland we have uh, lots of uh, we have in, in Poland we have 75 system in almost uh, 100 cities uh, which offer almost 22,000 bikes for rent uh, uh, last year uh, we bike rental have some problems and the, the fight with uh, electric scooter uh, rental uh, companies uh, it's a uh, now it's a uh, more than half the half of the market uh, but uh, it's still uh, developing and uh, one of uh, half of the all uh, shake bike fleas are, are avail available in the forest cities it's worse of which uh, of and Poznan and uh, mm, the most uh, popular system based on the rental bikes uh, based on the length of the bike ride bike rides and the uh, first 30 minutes is uh, for rent for free and what can we do to change it so it's the the first thing and that we can change is a uh, recovery of the COVID pandemic. We saw in the every single company that uh, rental uh, drops and the uh, bicycle index, uh, and uh, we need to increase an improvement of the situation and uh, 
develop the mm, uh, demand of the uh, sector. Uh, as I said before, the, there is a fight with the scooter rental system. It uh, will uh, some situation like um, popularity of bike rental is uh, lower than in the before before they showed on the market. Um, what is important is the expansion of the infrastructure. So we need to create a new uh, bike station in the right location, which will be uh, easier to rent for the citizen. Uh, the most important thing is uh, increased safety for cyclists. So improve, improving the security of and safety of the people who, who rent this bike. So bike lanes uh, and the law which can protect the uh, Polish people for uh, and bikers for from cars. And definitely, it show it must to improve. We must improve the technical quality of the rented bikes. Uh, sometimes it's damaged, or we can't uh, rent it because it's uh, it's impossible. So it's the main information from Poland. I don't uh, want to talk much more because we. I think we lack of time. Excellent. Thank you very much for, uh, for that as well. And obviously, those best practices can also be can also affect certain levers, for example, activity levels for um, for cycling. And uh, so that's um, and emissions from pass uh, from from buses. Um, so thank you very much for that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we just have we do have questions from Daniel Bongard. Thank you very much for the question as well. I will just take the first one. Uh, would it be possible to adapt it to countries outside of Europe? Yes, very much so. Depending on the data availability, let us know if you would like to get in touch to explain how this Excel file works, how can you operationalize the data. Uh, you have, you, you see our my contact details here. Uh, the second one goes to Christina. Um, thank you for sharing this. Um, um, has TEDIT been applied to prepare the SUMPs um, beyond, the, uh, beyond the EU as well? Uh, did you apply TEDIT for the plan, uh, for the SUMP plan, uh, Christina? Yeah, no, unfortunately, no, but uh, Vilnius SMP actually was also data driven. We have uh, open data for almost everything which is measured in Vilnius, but unfortunately, we didn't have that by that time. And that was missed, as I said, uh, given priorities to measures what solution should be implemented first. We basically we were looking at the impact on health, which was possible to somehow estimate an economical benefits like saved lives uh, i don't know spend money on infrastructure but we didn't we didn't have this environmental indicator which was pity but yeah now we are discussing the ministry of transport very widely and we are creating new system which i i briefly mentioned it and we are discussing how to benefit out of this tool like we did it in, in national system first and then uh, to to low down it to the local city to the local cities level excellent thank you for that and the last one goes for raul um what kind of vehicles will be allowed to enter the zones and what kind of fleet renewal do you expect raul That's okay. I, I was muted. Sorry about yeah. that. Um, I the most important thing uh, is to follow the calendar. So the calendar will say that I'll give you an example Euro 4 by 2023, 31st of December, can enter, and then boom, it's over. Uh, that, that, that's all there is, and then gradually for all kinds of uh, cars you know, with different uh, uh, sorts of engines and emissions, uh, they're gonna be banned slowly, slowly. This is how it's happening in Brussels, for example, and it's, it's, it's working out. So Euro 4 is out already, but then Euro 5 will be out by say 2024. Uh, Euro 6 will go for a little more. And the planning, the whole calendar should go to say 2030 in this case, but with the shootout towards 2050, if you want. Now, um, uh, what kind of fleet renewal I'm expecting? I'm I'm not expecting a certain fleet. I mean, I'm not expecting a car being replaced by other car. I'm expecting that uh, there's a whole change of local philosophy when it comes to to mobility, and that is linked to, first of all, electrification and digitalization. 
And as long as uh, people start using smarter ways and means of transport, uh, such as, uh, uh, say, trams at certain times or um, mobility as a service, so using cars that are available for a certain uh, time and for a certain distance. And also, I would, I would be also interested in um, taxing personal cars, private cars, on the actual usage of it. So this is something that also the region of Brussels is trying to do. I don't know if it's going to be possible, but it takes a lot of... Uh, um, smart electronic equipment to follow this. So basically, um, the most important thing is how long you use the car. Because you can you can have like a big diesel SUV, but drive it like once a month. You know, like an elderly person just goes with that SUV from uh, X to Y once a month. She's visiting her friend. You know. That's that's why that SUV is not super polluter in the end, you know. So the, the, the whole idea, I'm I'm not looking for excuses for SUVs whatsoever, but the whole idea is to to actually tax the usage of a car uh, on one hand, and then the other digitalization and electrification to the max, but not replacing cars. That's that's dumb, really. Excellent. Thank you very much uh, for the for the answers as well. And uh, again, thank to the organizers of, of the Transport Week. Um, it's been a great opportunity to present our new approach. Um, and those of you who still remain and then listen to us, get in touch if you have ideas for best practices that could address some of the levers. We're looking forward to hearing from you. And we're also happy to share all the information regarding TEDIT and provide kind of maybe quick session on how to use it. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Take care. Thank you.